So I do want to get started. Um, welcome to Mini Medical School. This is week three. Um, tonight's attendance is going to be taken by survey again, the same way that we did it last week. A link to the survey will be put in the chat momentarily. So if you are joining us tonight on the webinar, please make sure you check the chat. It will go in as soon as Dr. Wimmer starts speaking. So when you fill out that survey, that will be your attendance check for today. If you are joining us on the phone, please just email the me. Please email me that you have. I'm not going to give my name out here because it's going to be recorded. But if you're joining us on the phone, please email me. Okay. And just let me know that you were here today. If you do not email me by nine o'clock or you do not fill out the survey by nine o'clock, you will not be counted as present. Okay. Just like last week. So no need to put any names or information into the chat. Just fill out the survey or if you're joining us by phone, email me. Okay. Easy peasy. So this is week three. Um, we're at the kind of at the end of tonight. We'll be at the halfway point. And we're going to hear a really great talk about interventional cardiology. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Neil Wimmer. Dr. Wimmer is a cardiologist at Christiana Care. He is board certified in cardiovascular disease and interventional cardiology by the American Board of Internal Medicine. Dr. Wimmer is an honors graduate of Brown University with a bachelor's degree in public policy and biology. He earned his medical degree and completed his residency in internal medicine at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine in Philadelphia. After achieving his Master of Science in Epidemiology from Harvard University School of Public Health, Dr. Wimmer completed fellowships in peripheral vascular and cardiac structural intervention, interventional cardiology, and cardiovascular disease at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. So I'm going to stop my screen sharing. And I'm going to let Dr. Wimmer take over. All right, thank you, Kate. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to everyone tonight. This is very exciting. Uh, and I'm gonna share with you a little bit about part of my job, which I think is the most fun job in all of medicine. Uh, I get to be an interventional cardiologist. So the first thing is, what does that mean? And we'll talk a little bit about that as I set up my slides here and hopefully you'll be able to see them shortly. Okay, Kate, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see? Okay, you got perfect. it. You're all good. Excellent. All right. So uh, thanks again. Um, being an interventional cardiologist, uh, as I said, is I think the most fun in all of medicine. This is the best field. I get to participate in the care uh, of patients sort of across the entire spectrum of their heart problems. Sometimes people come to me when they're just concerned that they have a concerning family history of heart disease. And sometimes people come to me uh, at two o'clock in the morning when they are literally on death's doorstep. And I get to help take care of patients across the entire spectrum uh, of their journey with heart disease. Uh, and it, it is fun. It's a challenging job. Uh, as you heard just from the biography, uh, it takes a lot of years of schooling and we can talk about that uh, a little bit, but this is a great job. So I wanna talk about one aspect of interventional cardiology, which is being able to participate in the care of patients who have heart valve problems and being able to do heart valve replacement without open heart surgery, uh, which is kind of an amazing thing. This entire field didn't exist 15 years ago. So one of the things that I wanna Kind of stress to everyone in the audience tonight is that one of the things that makes this a great job, besides the fact that you get uh, to be a doctor in clinical medicine, is that the field changes incredibly rapidly and that what people are doing today is likely going to be very different uh, when some of you become physicians in the future, hopefully, uh, and are able to provide medical care to your neighbors and friends and family. Uh, so like all kind of medical lectures, we're going to start with a case. So this is a patient uh, who I saw who gave me permission to show a little bit about his situation. So he's a patient I saw in the office. He's 84. Uh, he lives with his son and remains active. He generally can get around at home pretty well. But when he walks up the stairs, he's limited by dyspnea, which just means that he gets out of breath. 
he's had a lot of medical issues in the past in his life. He has had coronary artery disease, which means blockages in his heart arteries, and has had bypass surgery. He has chronic kidney disease, which is what CKD is. And one of the measures of how significant that is, is something called the creatinine. He's had a mini stroke or TIA, and he has had what's called a aortic aneurysm repair uh, that was done with a catheter procedure several years ago. So he's had a lot of things go on in his medical life. And he came to see me because he was out of breath going upstairs. When I did my physical exam and talked to him in the office, I noted the things that cardiologists noted. One that was that his blood pressure was a little bit elevated. The second was that when I put my fingers over his carotid arteries in his neck, you could feel, if you've done this a lot, that the pulse that emanated from his heart, that started with his heart and ended up in his carotid arteries, came on pretty slowly. And when I feel my own carotid arteries, the beat comes very rapidly. But sometimes people's carotid beats come very slowly. So we noticed that that's called parvus and tardis, a little bit of Latin. Uh, and that when I listened with the stethoscope, I heard a certain kind of characteristic heart murmur that happens while the heart squeezes called an systolic heart murmur. And then I couldn't hear the opening sound of one of the heart valves when I listened. He had an EKG that showed that his heart was under strain, which means that his heart was working very, diff very hard uh, in order to pump blood to get it to circulate. And so what was his problem? This is his problem. So this is actually the picture of a real person's heart valve taken during surgery on the right. When you look at the heart valve here, this should be nice, thin tissue leaflets that when the heart squeezes below, the heart valve leaflets pop open and closed and open and closed with every heartbeat. And you can see on this person's heart valve that there are these stones that are attached and all of this scar tissue. And so instead of beating like this and like this and down, closed and open and closed and open, the person's heart valve leaflets don't have the room to do that. They're too stiff. They just barely open a little bit. And that's characteristic of this thing that is shown here in the upper left called degenerative calcific aortic stenosis, which just means that people develop these calcified bits of scar tissue on the valve leaflets so the valve doesn't open. And it generally happens to people as they age so this man in his 80s was kind of right in the ballpark for this problem. People can have aortic valve stenosis, which is narrowing of the heart valve from a number of different reasons. They can have what's called rheumatic heart disease, which happens occasionally. Some people are born with funny heart valves and can come to medical attention either as young adults or middle-aged adults. And sometimes people are born with things that come to attention when they're really young, like babies. Uh, and that's pretty rare. This is the most common kind uh, of heart valve problem for this valve. And it was almost certainly what was causing our patient's symptoms. The traditional treatment for this that has been done for about 30 or 35 years is open heart surgery, where a heart surgeon goes in and replaces the valve. The downside of that is shown here. So if I plugged this patient's situation into a calculator developed by the cardiac surgeons across the United States that actually predicts if we were to put this patient uh, through heart surgery, what their risk of dying on the table would be. It's somewhere between four and 5%, which is a lot. That means somewhere between uh, sort of one in 20 and one in 25 patients who have this problem in this situation don't make it through surgery. And if you look at the risk of the this patient having either a severe complication which in this case they're calling morbidity or dying during the procedure, it's about one in four. So very high odds that if we were to put this patient who just feels out of breath through heart surgery, they would have some really big problem at the time of surgery. Uh, and most people want to try to avoid that. So how do we make this diagnosis in more clarity? Well, the best way to do that is with what's called an ultrasound. We can actually see the heart valve uh, with an ultrasound as the heart is moving uh, in the body. And if you look across big, big groups of patients, somewhere around 14% of all people kind of walking around who have echocardiograms have some degree of this heart valve problem called aortic stenosis. Whereas about 3% of people who have echoes have a severe form of this disease. And you can actually see it on the ultrasound here. There's all this thick calcified scar tissue on this valve and it doesn't open very well. When you're looking in the image at the top left, this is just a different view of that valve. The upper chamber of the heart is here. 
Blood goes through the valve that's right here into this chamber and then out through this valve. And this is the valve we're talking about. On this screen, this valve should be almost not viewable, but here it's very calcified and bright white. And that's very abnormal if you've looked at a lot of these scans. So that's, this is how we make the diagnosis besides listening with the stethoscope. And we can calculate how severe the valve is by using some principles that people learn in physics class. So one of the reasons that I think this part of medicine, besides the fact that I get to take care of patients across the spectrum of disease, and the fact that we have a field that moves really quickly and is rapidly evolving, is that I get to use all different kinds of skills in my job every day. So one of them is understanding physics and how some things like ultrasound work. So we calculate how severely narrowed the valve is here when we can't actually see it, even with ultrasound, by relying on what's called Bernoulli's equation, which is just a physical principle that says that the amount of energy carried by the blood that's moving before the valve narrows is the same here as it is here. And if blood is going to make it through a valve that's narrowed, it has to speed up for the same volume of blood to make it from this very wide area to this very narrow area. And so what we do when we estimate how bad this problem is, is we make some measurements and calculate what we think the area is at this point where the valve narrows. By measuring the speed of blood below the valve, we measure the area of the blood that the blood goes through below the valve. Then we measure the speed of blood as it goes through the valve and calculate the area of the valve at that point. And you do that with the equation that's over here on the right by making the measurements here on the person's heart valve. And what you can do is actually measure the significant speed that the blood goes up through as it goes through the valve. I think the most intuitive way to understand this is understanding what happens to water as it flows through the Colorado River. When the river is nice and wide, the water in that river goes nice and smoothly. And as soon as you make it into the Grand Canyon and there's rapids, the river narrows. And the only thing that can happen at that point is for the water to speed up as it goes through those rapids. And that's exactly what we're measuring here when we measure, make measurements at the level of the heart valve. And so you have to kind of understand how we make the measurements in order to judge how severe someone's valve problem is. The second way we can make this measurement is actually by doing invasive measurements, which is what I do as an interventional cardiologist. We actually go into people's bodies with catheters, which are tubes that are put in through the blood vessels, and we snake those catheters through the aorta, which is the main blood vessel above the heart, through the aortic valve, which is right here, and put a catheter inside the heart itself and another catheter outside the heart. And then you measure the pressure difference to, by directly measuring the pressure in here, inside the chamber and outside the chamber. And that gives us the difference in pressure between this curve here and the curve that's here. And what should happen is when the heart valve opens, there should be no pressure difference between this curve and this curve. And what you can see in this patient uh, that has measure, had measurements taken uh, during this catheterization procedure is that they have this whole big pressure difference. And that pressure gradient represents the amount of effort that the heart has to generate in order to open the valve. Pressure has to build up as the heart is squeezing. And that's represented here in order for those, those calcified scarred leaflets to pop open. And so what does that mean? Well, most people do actually do very well with this problem for a long time. So if you look at a plot of age, and how people do with this valve problem, people do very well for many, 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 many decades until they kind of fall off a cliff. And once they start to develop symptoms, people start to die and they survive for not very much longer. And so people do well. So we try to watch people without doing something until we get to this point where the curve is going to take a dive. And at that point, we want to catch them before bad things start happening to people. And that's when we want to do something. And the best way to treat this problem is by replacing the heart valve. So you can look at that another way. As people's heart has to work harder by squeezing really hard in order to generate a very high flow velocity on the echo, which is what I was just showing you. So if you look at the curve in yellow, that's people with very high velocities and compare that to people with velocities that are not so high. 
the people with velocities that are really high don't do very well. And so we watch people when the velocity is low or when the velocity is moderate, but by the time the velocity gets severe or on the right, very, very severe, we like to replace the heart valve because we'd like to avoid this becoming a deadly process. And so just to give you a sense of how deadly it is, if you take a group of people with this problem and just follow them with medicine without replacing their heart valve, this is how often they die. So this is the amount of time from when they've been identified and put into a study. And if you just watch people at 12 months, about 50% of patients die. If you go out to about 24 months, two years, it's almost 70% of people die. This is a really, really, really bad problem for patients. And so we need to intervene once we get to that point where people are about to fall off the cliff that I showed you a minute ago. Sometimes people's hearts are actually sick to the point where they can't squeeze hard enough in order to generate that flow. And so sometimes people can actually have very diseased valves, even though they can't generate that very high velocity. And so that's actually a worse problem uh, that people can develop. And that's called this thing that's called low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis. It can be a big problem actually for us to diagnose because our echo is not as good for making the diagnosis. And it also means that people often don't do very well when it, can, when it happens. So what do we do for people? Well, the generally accepted treatment for this is heart valve surgery. And with heart valve surgery, people who have their valve replaced generally live. They survive. People who don't have surgery, like I just showed you, don't do very well, and they often die. So the classic treatment for this that's been done, as I said, for several decades is that people get open heart surgery. Open heart surgery works really, really well, but open heart surgery is a huge deal. It's a huge deal. People come into the hospital, a surgeon opens their chest through the bone in the middle of the chest called the sternum. So they do what's called a sternotomy. They expose the heart. They connect all of these tubes that you see in this schematic drawing, uh, and then they stop the patient's heart. They put the patient on the heart-lung bypass machine, and so it replaces the work of the heart. They actually open the heart, opening it right here, like shown from above, and then they sew in a new valve. And those valves can either be made from the tissue from a pig or cow, or it can be made from a, what's called a mechanical valve, from metal or plastic. Those valves work very well, and the surgeon closes everything up at the end of the procedure. But as you can imagine, when someone needs to be opened like this, it's a huge deal to recover. So heart valve surgery can be done through an incision as small as about this incision on the right. This is a man's chest where the smallest incision you can do heart valve surgery through is here. And traditionally, the surgery actually created an incision that was the whole sternum from about here all the way up. More and more surgery now is being performed through incisions that are smaller, so this size incision, but it's still a huge deal to recover from this. It's also quite risky to do these surgery procedures. So these are all the best data we have from all the heart surgeries that happened across the country from the years um, 2006 to 2017. And you can see that when people have their aortic valve replaced, about 2% of people don't make it through surgery, which is actually quite a lot. Um, compared to some of the other surgeries uh, that people can have. When you start to make the open heart surgery even more complicated, where they have aortic valve surgery plus what's called coronary artery bypass surgery, or two valve surgery, where you replace the aortic valve and another valve called the mitral valve, people do even worse because the surgery is even more complicated. And all that goes along with people needing to be in the hospital for a while after surgery. So if you look at the just the dots that are black and filled in, that's how long people stay in the hospital on average after surgery. So it's somewhere around seven days, about a week patients stay in the hospital. It's gotten better over the decade from 2008 to 2017, but it's still about a week that people stay in the hospital with uncomplicated aortic valve surgery. And so that's a lot to recover from, particularly when you're like the person who I showed you before, uh, who's in his 80s. That's a big deal. Now, you can imagine that not all people uh, are equally good as candidates for surgery. So you can imagine that this person who doesn't have a lot of other medical problems, as compared to this person who's a decade younger, but has a very, 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 very calcified aorta, 
that makes it difficult for a surgeon to operate. Or this person who's had a lot of other heart surgery before, or excuse me, chest wall surgery before, uh, makes it difficult to recover from heart surgery. So just knowing people's age or the things that are wrong medically doesn't always tell the whole story. Heart surgery is very complicated uh, and people can do better or less well, depending on what they've had to go through medically over the course of their life. And so often what this discussion has come down to when people have this valve surgery is do people wanna undergo heart surgery or do we wanna think of things like end of life care with hospice? That's sort of been the traditional discussion uh, for the last several decades. Now, when you couple that with the fact that Americans are just getting older, the number of people who are 85 years old who are likely to have this problem is more and more, you understand that somewhere around 50 to 60% of patients didn't want to have open heart surgery. And that's where things stood for a long, long time. So just to summarize where we are so far, I've said a lot of things. One is this heart valve problem called aortic stenosis is common. It can be a really serious problem and it can be deadly for a lot of people. And it can be treated with open heart surgery. But open heart surgery comes at a big risk. People have to recover for a long time, and that recovery is really difficult for a lot of people. So uh, now, about a decade ago, people came up with a new treatment, this thing called TAVR, or transcatheter aortic valve replacement. And so when people before who had this valve problem all used to have surgery, or they used to have medical therapy, which didn't work so well because we didn't really replace the valve, and then people died. And so people came up with this thing called transcatheter aortic valve replacement, or TAVR, which really was like a disruptive technology. It totally changed the field. And this was the French guy's drawings who kind of came up with this idea. He said, well, we can put metal scaffolds that open arteries in patient, patients' hearts or in other places. Why can't we do that with a valve on the inside? And so what I'm going to do is build a valve that's inside of a scaffold called a stent. And we're gonna put a balloon on the inside of that where you can put this device inside the patient's narrowed heart valve. You can blow up the balloon, you wedge the stent in place, you take everything out, and then you are done treating the patient and it happens very quickly uh, and can, the person can get better. So this is what it looks like uh, kind of in schematic form. We now have these very, very fancy but also kind of simple metal scaffolds with heart valves built on the inside that sit inside the aortic valve uh, and we leave them there. And this is what it looks like. So this is a little animation. So what we do is we put a guide wire from the blood vessel starting in the artery at the top of the leg. We snake it up into the patient's heart. So it's in through the narrowed valve, which is up here. And over that wire, we place a catheter that has a narrowed down stent with a valve on the inside. And you could see that the heart kind of quivers there for a second when I play this video. We actually send a ton of electrical signals at the heart very fast to stimulate the heart so much that it actually gets kind of overwhelmed. It can't beat. And while the heart is paused, we inflate the balloon, just like you see, and we rely on the calcified scar tissue of the valve leaflets to wedge the valve in place. We don't actually have to sew it in. And so we're working outside the patient's body, just like it's a video game. This is what it looks like on the x-rays that we use to actually see where we're going. So you have the stent that hasn't yet been inflated with a balloon on the inside. We take some pictures with x-rays to fill the blood vessel. We know we're inside the valve. So the heart is down here to the right. The aorta, the main blood vessel above the valve, is to the left. We position it in the right spot. We bombard the heart with all those electrical signals. We pause the heart. We blow up the balloon. The stent expands, and then it gets wedged into place. And then we take a picture and make sure everything looks good. Up here are the heart arteries that come off right above the heart valve. And we hope when we do this properly that we don't cause any blockage to those heart arteries. The other thing that made this technique possible was this brilliant invention that somebody had where they said we're going to take a essentially the equivalent of a lure that you would do when you're going fly fishing we're going to put it on this device that we can stick into arteries and we can make a hole in the artery quite big and then you just advance this fly knot essentially down 
and are able to do surgery through a tiny, tiny, tiny incision that's just a few millimeters. And so we can make quite a big hole in someone's artery in order to deliver the valve. And then you can close it like this picture at the bottom of right. Uh, and so the patient doesn't have any bleeding. So this was also kind of a major breakthrough that happened at the same time as the valve stent technology came into being. Uh, and before those two advances, none of this stuff was possible. So this is what it looks like in the modern day. I actually did two of these procedures earlier today. I'm still wearing my scrubs. Um, you see we have a valve that's made of this metal um, called cobalt chromium. It's a metal alloy. Inside is valve material that's taken from the lining of a cow heart. We have this thing called a skirt on the outside that prevents leakiness around the valve. And it, they gave it this name called Sapien. This is the third generation three, uh, and it works very well. So if you actually now look at the data I showed you before, so the people in black are people who didn't get heart replacement, heart valve replacement when this technology was first being studied. The people in blue was the survival of people who did get the first generation of this device. And you can see that there's a big separation uh, between these curves of how well people did in terms of survival. So if you look at one year, in the people who didn't have their heart valve replaced, about 50% of people were dead. But in the people who did have their heart valve replaced, 31% of people are dead representing about a 20% improvement in people's survival. Now, a lot of these patients, like I showed you, are older people who die from other things. People don't live to be 130 years old, but there's a big, 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 big difference in survival. So at one year, you need to treat five patients in order to prevent one person from being dead, which is pretty dramatic, actually, uh, and a big, big improvement. So. In the beginning, when this stuff first came out, it came at the cost of bleeding and what we call vascular complications, where people, uh, because of the size of the equipment, had problems where we went into the arteries, usually in the leg. And so in the beginning with TAVI or TAVR, which is the valve replacement, people had more bleeding or more vascular complications as compared to when we didn't do the procedure. They also, in the beginning, had more strokes because as we pushed this large device through the blood vessels, it came at a cost where you could knock off pieces of plaque and it could go to your brain and cause a stroke. And that was a major, major, major problem. Now, this technology improved dramatically from when the first procedure was done by this guy Cribier uh, in Paris in 2002, all the way now through 2023, which is not even on the slide, where a lot of things happen in terms of we learned more about this stuff and we developed better technology where the equipment got a little bit smaller and we got better at it. And so what started as us only doing open heart surgery for these patients evolved. Initially in 2011, we learned that we could safely do this procedure in people who either were too sick for surgery or were high risk for surgery. But if people were still good surgical candidates, we still did surgery. The field evolved even more. And so what we started with were these big, big tubes that we had to deliver the equipment for that were about eight millimeters or 24 French in diameter that would go in the blood vessels. We started with these valves that had no skirt on the outside. And then we went from generation one to generation two. And all the way now we're putting in generation three, just one decade later. And because of engineering advances, we're able to shrink the system down that we can deliver it through a tube that's much smaller now than what it was when we started in 2011, 2012, and we're able to offer many more sizes of valves that go from 20 millimeters to 29 millimeters, when in the beginning, we only had two sizes of valves, these kind of intermediate sizes. And you can imagine people come in different sizes. And so sometimes people have small valves and sometimes people have big valves, and it's nice to be able to treat everybody. So now when we compare surgery and this TAVR procedure, even in patients who are much, much healthier, TAVR performs just as well as surgery, which is good. If you actually look at uh, how people did with the third generation device, now TAVR performs better. So on this axis are bad things that can happen to people. Either they die or have a stroke, and TAVR seems now to perform better. Less people have these problems than when they get open heart surgery with the regular valve. So the device went from being doable, but at the risk of more strokes, to now being doable, and it's actually safer than it is to have surgery, to have this valve replacement. If you look at it a different way, 
When you look at mortality, meaning how often people die, TAVR is better. If you look at stroke, people have less stroke. It does come at a small risk. There can still be some leakiness around the valve that actually is better with surgery because the surgeon is able to sew in a watertight seal and we don't always get a perfect seal. But that has gotten better as we have gotten better at doing these procedures and we've learned a lot more about how to do this. So an illustration of how that's happened is if you look at how often people have died with this procedure, when we first started doing this procedure, all the way on the left, about 6% of people died before they made it out of the hospital. And now that's down to about 1%. It's actually even better than that now uh, as compared to this slide. And stroke has gotten better too. So we had a big amount of strokes in the beginning as the technology was being developed. And now that's gotten way, way better as we have learned more, as the technology has learned more. And so one of the things that I wanna leave everybody with, again, is that this field has evolved really rapidly and that things have changed a lot over even the last 10 years, where now we can do many, many more things safer and for more people than we ever were able to do before. So when I was in medical school, for instance, this field didn't exist. And after medical school, in order to be an interventional cardiologist, you then do what's called a residency, where you train uh, as kind of a junior doctor. This field didn't exist. And then I became what's called a cardiology fellow, where you learn cardiology. This field was kind of in its infancy, but was not yet of this procedure was not yet available widely. It was only available at the hospitals across the world where it was being studied. And finally, by the time I became a full fledged interventional cardiologist after that, was this technology kind of rolled out and made available uh, to people across the world because it takes some time to develop this stuff. And one of the things that's important. In, people's careers in medicine is that you're willing to kind of understand and learn new things all the time and so that you can then continue to offer state-of-the-art treatments to your patients. All right, so we started, as I showed, everybody got surgery before if you had this valve problem. Then in 2011, we started to offer TAVR to some people. We got better in 2018 and could offer it to intermediate risk patients. And finally, we have a study where TAVR is clearly better. The percent of people who have bad outcomes with TAVR was way less than the percent of people who had bad outcomes with surgery. And you can see that that's true of when you add a number of things together, whether people have death, stroke, or get hospitalized, or all the things kind of broken up and looked at separately. Now, when you think about it, what are we really doing with this technology? Well, the thing that we actually accomplish is that we make people feel better faster. Open heart surgery is a great treatment. It's just that it takes a long time to recover. And so that's reflected here. So this thing on the left, NYHA class, if you're class two, three, or four, it means you still have symptoms where your valve is, remains a problem. And so at 30 days after TAVR, the percent of people who still have symptoms is way less with TAVR than it is with people who've had open heart surgery. But by the time it, a year goes by, people have generally recovered from open heart surgery and people do the same. You could say the same thing for this thing on the far right called KCCQ, which stands for Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire. The higher people do, the better they feel. And so initially after 30 days, people feel way better with TAVR, the dark bar, as compared to surgery, the light bar. But after a year, people feel better because once they've recovered from open heart surgery, there's really no benefit to how your valve is replaced. Your valve has been replaced. And so everybody feels better. So the benefit of this procedure is really that we can just make people feel better, faster, with less risk at the time of the procedure. That's true of kind of across all the different subgroups. And one of the things I want to uh, just highlight here is that when we're evaluating this technology, you have to really understand how to read scientific papers in order to figure this stuff out. If all this looks like uh, a bunch of gibberish, it's impossible to interpret. But when you take the time to learn how to read these papers, you can understand that what we're seeing here is that we're comparing TAVR to the left of this, line, this dotted line versus surgery to the right. And when the estimates across all these different eight things like young and old people, men and women, people with different what's called ejection fractions, everything here favors the TAVR. Uh, as compared to surgery. And so one of the things I like is that you're constantly applying uh, the ability to learn scientific things uh, newly when you're in medicine and staying current.
And so how do we do things now? We started with SAVR, surgery being the dominant therapy. And now it's kind of the other way around. TAVR is the dominant therapy. We do TAVR on almost everybody who has this problem, except for some special circumstances, which I put over here uh, to the right. Now, we can do TAVR mostly through an incision, a small incision in the leg, and we go through the blood vessels and deliver our equipment that way. But sometimes we do it through a surgical incision. If people can't have the TAVR equipment fit through their blood vessels, sometimes we do it through a surgical incision in the chest, uh, right through the aorta specifically. Sometimes we actually do this wild procedure where we go through the vein we actually electrify a piece of equipment inside the body and poke a hole between two blood vessels and go from the vein into the artery. We then grab the equipment in the artery and put the tube from the vein into the artery, do the procedure like that, and then plug the hole at the end. And so we have gotten really creative about how we can deliver these valves. And the bottom line is you just have to be able to deliver the heart valve into the heart valve that's there by some way or another. In fact, here's a case where the person's aorta was very close to the skin in their abdomen. They were very, 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 very skinny. And so we did a surgical incision in the uh, abdomen, in the belly, moved their intestines over and were able to go straight through there. And this is just a picture of what it looks like in the operator. So you can figure out a way to deliver the valve. Patients can get a new uh, heart valve without having to have open heart surgery. Sometimes people uh, do so well with this procedure that we actually discharge them on the same day. They don't have to stay in the hospital at all except a few hours to recover. And generally now, we do this procedure without general anesthesia, which means we just sedate people that they're in kind of a twilight. I did two procedures this morning uh, where people had valve replacements, and both of those patients were talking to me the entire time they were having their valves replaced. They had their valve replaced. I said, you know, sir, you've had your valve replaced. He said, oh, great. I didn't know anything was happening. Uh, and they're totally awake. They're just sedated a tiny bit so they don't kind of know what's going on, uh, which is a major advance. You can imagine if you're in your 80s and don't have to go under general anesthesia, people do much better. So just in summary, we started where we treated all these people with surgical aortic valve replacement and things have evolved to the point where now we're doing TAVR in most patients. But when don't we do that? Well, there's still some very specific medical situations where that doesn't make sense. The first is, we didn't really talk about it, but that these valves can wear out. And so they valves last somewhere between 10 and 15 years on average. And so if the person who has this problem is say 40 years old and is likely to live to age 80, then putting a valve that's gonna wear out in 10 years just means they're gonna need another procedure in 10 years. And so sometimes we put in what's called a mechanical valve, which is a kind of valve that doesn't wear out. So far, no one has figured out how to put in a mechanical valve except through open heart surgery. Sometimes people need other kinds of surgery at the same time. So they have what's called aortic stenosis, but they also have aortic aneurysms, which can only be fixed through surgery. And so sometimes those people undergo surgery and have everything fixed the same so at the same time. Sometimes people have what's called a very large aortic annulus, which just means that the valve itself is bigger than the valves we are able to pull off the shelf and use because no one has manufactured them. And so if people have unusual sized valves, either too small or too large, usually too large, um, we obviously can't put a valve because it won't fit. Sometimes people, we can't put the valve in through the arteries and the legs, and then it just makes sense more sense to have open heart surgery in some situations. And most commonly, sometimes people have this valve problem, aortic stenosis, with blockages in the coronary artery disease in multiple vessels. And so those patients are going to undergo bypass at the same time as valve replacement. And if they're going to need bypass anyway, sometimes we recommend that they have their valve replaced at the same time. So those are kind of the few times when in the modern era, we choose not to do this catheter procedure and instead send patients for open heart surgery. Now, as I said, this field has evolved really, really rapidly in just the last decade, but things are getting even better. And so we're coming out with smaller devices. We're figuring out more and more ways to put these valves in. We've actually done some procedures through the carotid arteries in some patients if they need it. Our rates of stroke as a complication are getting way less. We actually have developed these new devices that can actually catch debris uh, that can be dislodged when you put the valve in, and so the risk of stroke is less. 
We also are developing new technology that prevents the leakiness around the valve with these better quote unquote skirts. Uh, and sometimes we are, have better ways to estimate people's valve size. And so we don't make the mistake of putting in the wrong size valve because we're working from outside the body rather than inside the body. Uh, and so we need to know the size of valve to pull off the shelf before we do it. Now, one of the reasons I really, really, really like doing this kind of work and being an interventional cardiologist is that I get to work with all different kinds uh, of people in the hospital. I am what's called an interventional cardiologist, and I do these procedures hands in hand with an open heart surgeon. We work together, which is pretty unusual. We do these procedures in concert with an anesthesiologist who sedates the patient at the time of the procedure. We rely really, really, really heavily on other kinds of cardiologists who do the ultrasound procedures or radiologists who help us plan these procedures. And none of this stuff is possible without help from other doctors who take care of these patients, most of the time who are pretty elderly, and the other people as part of our medical team. So there's a huge team of nurses and technicians who make this possible. So this is really, really, really a teamwork game. And so the only way to do successful TAVI um, or TAVR is by playing as part of a team. And to me, that's both challenging because sometimes teamwork is hard, but also really, really rewarding. And it underscores the nature of how healthcare is moving, that it is impossible to do these procedures, even if you are the most talented, most successful, uh, most brilliant person alone. You just can't have a successful outcome for patients. You have to work in a team. And for me, that's really gratifying. So the bottom line for all of this stuff is that TAVR, this valve procedure, is now FDA approved, so available for essentially everybody who has aortic stenosis, and that understanding the role of TAVR in certain groups, like younger people who are going to outlive their valve, will continue to evolve. And so my prediction is that over the next 10 years, that's going to be the area that we're going to refine the most uh, in this field and figure out for the people who are going to live longer than the valve will last, what's the best strategy for treating those patients. Sometimes we can put a TAVR valve inside of a TAVR valve that we've just placed. Sometimes people need surgery, but the best thing is still up in the air. And if you ask me, uh, I don't know all the time what the best option is for a young person who has this valve problem. And we talk about it. Uh, and one of the things that we also convey to patients is that there is some uncertainty about this. Uh, and that's also one of the interesting things uh, about working in this role as an interventional cardiologist, that sometimes you tell people what you're very sure of, and sometimes you have to tell people what you're really unsure of. Uh, and we still need to make a decision and try to uh, treat every patient uh, the best way we can. So that's those are the things I wanted to say about TAVR. I do want to show you one other kind of very cool thing we can do with patients' heart valves. So patients can have a different valve problem instead of a valve problem with the aortic valve, which is the valve that separates the heart from the main blood vessels. There's a valve right before that called the mitral valve where blood goes into the main pumping chamber of the heart from the upper chamber through this valve called the mitral valve. The mitral valve uh, works very different from the aortic valve. In this figure, the aortic valve is, very, is up here to the left and this is the mitral valve. You can see the mitral valve has all these cords and there's these muscles that attach to it and it works very differently than the aortic valve. When these muscles contract, it pulls the valve open uh, and then the valve closes and forms a watertight seal. Sometimes this valve, its major problem is that it can leak and it can happen because of a number of different things. One is that people have extra tissue, kind of floppy tissue, where the valve leaflet kind of bows back and bends back into the upper chamber, and that can cause a separation that causes leakiness of blood back into the upper chamber. The second is you can actually have a heart attack, and then these muscles don't work very well. That's called a flail leaflet, and again, it creates a separation. And then the other major thing that can go wrong with this valve is that if the heart becomes weak for any reason, it can get dilated, it just doesn't work very well as a pump. And as it gets more and more dilated, the valve gets pulled apart. And as the valve gets pulled apart, even if the valve itself is normal, because the supporting tissue around it gets pulled apart, the leaflets can't reach to form a watertight seal. 
That's called functional mitral regurgitation or functional mitral leakiness. So people came up with this very, very cool idea in order to treat this valve problem, which is called a mitral clip or a transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair. And so here's what it is. We put this device through the vein at the top of the leg. We bring the device up like these arrows are pointing. We then actually use a needle while the heart is beating from inside, poke a hole in the beating heart and go from the upper chamber on one side to the upper chamber on the other, and then steer this device down under the heart valve and grab it with this clip device and then lock it down. And so it holds the heart valve together. And so if you're looking at the heart valve from above, from the upper chamber, what you create is what's called a double orifice or two opening mitral valve that's held together in the middle usually by this clip. And so when the valve is open, there's two areas for blood to flow alongside the clip. And when the valve is closed, the clip helps hold everything together. So there's less leakiness. This is what it looks like in real practice. So this is an ultrasound that's guiding me as I do the procedure. And here's the clip on uh, sitting above the patient's valve, which is at this level. This is what's called the upper, upper chamber called the left atrium. And this is the left ventricle. We then steer the clip underneath the valve and pull it back up and grab the valve tissue. And this is a what's called a 3D echo or a 3D ultrasound that helps us orient the clip kind of perpendicular to the moving valve and then grab the valve tissue. And so this is what you are left with in real life uh, for this patient where you create this double orifice valve that when it's open, blood can still get through, but when it's closed, provides a better watertight seal. So somebody feels better. And so one of the things you can see is how high these waves are, which represents how much leakiness is back into the upper chamber. Some of this other echo stuff is a little bit, uh, we don't really need to dwell on that. So this is the, how the patient came into the lab. Uh, and before we did anything, they had these V waves that went as high as 60 millimeters of mercury, way high. We put in one clip and the V waves uh, came down here. I'm sorry, this got covered to about 25 or 30. Things still looked good on these images on the left. And then we put in another clip and now the V waves are basically gone and the pressure is normal. Now the pressure is about 12 or 13. Uh, and so we've taken it from where the patient had V waves to start of 60 millimeters of mercury and basically gotten rid of all the leakiness by just clipping the valve together. And one of the things you worry about is what's shown here on the far left, that sometimes when you grab the valve together, you can actually make a leaky valve, a narrowed valve, and that's a different problem, but we don't have that as measured by this thing called the transmitral gradient, which remained only three, which is great. Uh, and so this procedure can work really well. So here is the evidence uh, where the blue represents the device and patients who had the device or the clip procedure did better, they had less death or less mitral valve surgery uh, as compared to patients who are just uh, basically treated with surgery initially. So that's the evidence that the device works. Interestingly, for the people who had that last class of mitral leakiness called functional mitral regurgitation, we have had two studies uh, that have evaluated whether this clip works well. And so in one of the studies, it looks like the device group has many fewer hospitalizations for bad mitral regurgitation causing heart failure, or people die less commonly when they get the device therapy with the clip. Interestingly, at the very, very same time, and actually uh, the same meeting, people presented data from another study looking at the same procedure and saw that there was really no difference in the probability uh, of having an event in the people who got just medicines versus the people who got the clip. And people have spent a lot of time trying to figure this out, and it's open to some interpretation why one study that looked at basically the same thing was different. The idea that people have come away with in the field is that the patients in the study were very different, that the people in this study, the Mitra FR study that was done mostly in Europe, but headquartered in France, uh, had patients whose hearts had become much, much sicker, and that by the time patients' hearts were so sick, doing the procedure didn't really help. Whereas in this study, the patients had the leaky valve, but their hearts weren't quite as sick. And so they weren't as far gone. And so that they're, the idea being that there's an optimal time where you have to find people when they have the problem, but before they're too sick in order to benefit uh, from the therapy. And so 
I just wanted to show that as a second very, very interesting thing that we can now do. So patients avoid open heart surgery and mitral valve replacement, and we can do a procedure just with a catheter that the patients go home mostly the next day uh, and don't have to recover. So I just want to stress, this field has changed tremendously, as I said, from the time that I was in medical school right after college, all the way through my training to the point where now we are doing these procedures essentially every day. And there's a whole team of us uh, at a place like Christiana Care that continue to provide this, these procedures to patients so they can be treated without having to undergo uh, open heart surgery. I think this is like the coolest thing in all of medicine. We've combined understanding physics to understanding technology innovation, to being able to read scientific studies, to being able to participate in the care of patients as they're really, really sick. Uh, and things continue to evolve and get better. And so I really, really believe that this is a great field to be in and that exciting times are ahead. So those were the things I was prepared to say. I'm happy for anybody to contact me. Uh, the easiest way is by email. If anyone can email me, here's my email. Um, if you have concerns about someone you know or a patient you'd like to send me uh, or somebody in your family who needs, you think needs this, uh, we have a whole office set up to do this uh, at the hospital. And so the easiest way to do that is actually to just call our office um, and or you can contact a woman named Mary Kate Carroll, uh, who is the nurse who kind of runs the program. Uh, but either of us are happy to talk more about this with you. Uh, I think uh, exciting times are ahead, as I said. So I will end my formal comments there. Uh, Kate, if you want to open things up, we can do that. Yes, we already have lots of good questions in the chat. Um, first, though, Dr. Wimmer, I want you to maybe, can you talk about how you got to where you are? Like, where did you start? What med school did you go to? Why did you pick this topic? What were you thinking? <laughs> sure. I didn't know how much you wanted me to talk about that. I'm happy to talk about that. So I uh, finished high school and went to college. I went to a four-year school. I went to Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, which is a great school. Uh, I was a biology major and also a public policy major. I've always been interested in like uh, how major institutions figure stuff out um, and combine those and thought I would go into medicine. So right after college, I went to medical school and I went to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia for a lot of reasons. Um, one is I kind of grew up near Philadelphia and wanted to be near family. Some of it is personal. Uh, my girlfriend at the time, who is now my wife of 18 years, also wanted to live in Philadelphia. That's important. Don't let anybody tell you it's not. Um, but also the medical school there is amazing. Um, I had the opportunity and I knew I would to do a lot of research activities. So during medical school, medical school is generally four years. I actually did an extra year, got a fellowship and did an extra year of research uh, on things related to this. And that really got me interested. I had always thought that I wanted to be a surgeon uh, and do orthopedics, fix broken bones, do hip replacements, knee replacements. I thought that was super cool. I love sports. I thought sports medicine was awesome. But I got to do research studying some of the things related to the vasculature and blood vessels uh, when I was in med school. I did that for an entire year. I actually made med school longer than it had to be uh, because I liked it so much and it really changed my interest and my trajectory. And so then decided when I finished med school, uh, that I was going to do training in internal medicine because I thought I wanted to study blood vessels uh, and kind of work at a big hospital where I could participate in either cardiology care uh, or vascular medicine, things like that. And so I did that. I was an in internal medicine, what's called intern and resident, where you're kind of a junior doctor who learns uh, how to take care of patients. So that's three years after medical school. I did that in Philadelphia, also at Penn. Uh, and then I decided that as part of that, because of this, all this stuff, I knew I wanted to train in cardiology. So I moved to what's called Brigham and Women's Hospital, which is one of the Harvard teaching hospitals in Boston, and did training in cardiology and interventional cardiology. Uh, during that time, I actually did more research uh, and got another degree in epidemiology, and so made things even longer. And I think the thing I learned in doing all that stuff is like, if you're going to pursue this kind of career in medicine, it is much, much more helpful if you like what you're doing. If you are scientifically inclined and know you want to be a part of clinical medicine and talk to patients and care for patients, 
this is like the world's most fascinating field. And it doesn't have to be cardiology. It could be anything in medicine. But if you want to do it well, as you saw just from the lecture that I just gave, it requires understanding a lot of different things. You got to understand science. You got to understand math. You got to understand a little bit about people. You have to be able to talk to people about death and dying. All that stuff is there. And doing that, getting the skills to do that takes a lot of time. And you got to commit to do that. Now, I love doing this. It's a job, but it took a long time. So I was thinking before uh, the lecture tonight, uh, I was having dinner with my wife before I came back to the hospital. Uh, and I was talking to my kids about this. And I started medical school immediately when I finished college. So I was 21 years old. I didn't finish training and get like a real, what's called an attending cardiologist job until I was like 37 years old. And all that time I was doing training. I loved it. And once you finish med school, you do get paid, but it's not a tremendous amount of money in the beginning. Uh, and you got to do what you like. And so if you like this, this is an awesome job. If you think you're doing it for some other reason, then you're going to like it. This is not a good gig for you. <laughs> that was very helpful. Thank you very much. I like that. All right, let's get to some of these questions. So you were talking about a cow's heart being implanted. Um, the question is, how does the body react to the cow's heart? Can it tell that it is a foreign object? Yeah, that's a great question. So we either make this valve material out of a cow or a pig heart. Um, generally, what happens is all mammals, really across mammals, have this sac that the heart sits in called the pericardium. And it's a sac of tissue that the heart sits in. And so instead of taking an actual cow or pig valve, they take the sac of tissue and they treat the tissue very, very heavily. So your body, so a person's body doesn't react to it. And then fashion that in a factory, which I've actually been to in California, uh, into a new valve. So it's not that we're using a cow valve, it's that we're using tissue from a cow uh, and fashioning it into a heart. But the tissue is treated extensively, and so your body doesn't react to it as foreign material. So you don't need to be on the same kind of medicines that suppress your immune system like people do who get, for instance, a transplant. So if people get a kidney transplant or a lung transplant or a heart transplant, they need to be on medicines that stop their body from rejecting the foreign tissue from some other person. This tissue basically uh, has been treated so much that you don't need to do any of that and your body just accepts it. Cool. Um, before I get more into the questions, just for anybody listening, re just a reminder, um, the survey for attendance has been put in the chat again. So if you haven't filled it out yet, please click it. Um, if you are on the phone, please email whoever sent you the links to get here. And we, so that we can get your attendance that way and attendance is gonna close at nine o'clock. Okay, back to the questions. Um, what do you think the next advance is going to be in this field? Yeah, that's a great question. So I showed you uh, some schematics uh, and one case of the mitral clip procedure. We still don't really have the ability to fully replace someone's mitral valve without surgery. A lot of different people are working on that and kind of spending their whole lives and careers trying to figure that out. Um, and I think one company is getting reasonably close. So my guess is that if I was giving this talk in five years, we will have the ability to fully replace a different heart valve called the mitral valve. As you saw, the pictures of the mitral valve are just more complicated than the other, the aortic valve, which is what I spent most of the time talking about. And so no one has totally mastered that yet. There's some promising stuff, but it's not really there yet. But my guess is in five years, we will have a mitral valve replacement technology that can be done without open heart surgery, which will be super cool. Because as common as aortic valve disease is, mitral valve disease is actually way more common. Um, and so I think a lot of patients would stand to benefit from that kind of technology. Sweet. What determines the type of valve you receive for surgery with TAVR or open heart? Uh, that's a great question. So we always talk to patients about what they want. There are some pros and cons of each valve. Um, the mechanical valves, which can only be put in surgically, last forever. They can only be put in with surgery, so you have to go through open heart surgery. And we didn't talk about this, but you also need to be on a heavy-duty blood thinner if you get one of those valves, so blood clots don't form on the valve. So that's a major downside. You can have a valve that lasts forever, but you're stuck taking a blood thinner 
forever. And that's fine unless, you know, you're in a car accident and bang your head or trip and fall down the stairs. Then being on a blood thinner is a big problem. Um, so that's one issue. Which specific valve, a cow valve or a pig valve, there's some design differences. And for some people, some fit better or work better or are going to be a bit better. But ultimately, it ends up being the patient's decision. Um, and so we kind of walk people through the options. Uh, but often it's a technical thing and we have pretty strong recommendations because we think one thing is going to fit better than the other. They only come in certain sizes. Like I'm limited in what I can pull off the shelf by what's on the shelf. Uh, and so if your valve is, you know, 29.5 millimeters, we want to be able to put a 29 millimeter valve. Putting a 26 millimeter valve isn't going to fit very well. Uh, and so that often determines things. Um, what happens to the patient's original valve? Do you remove part of the disease valve, leave it all there to help hold the replacement valve? Can the new valve get issues? Yeah, Lots that's all those are good questions. <laughs> so, uh, patient's valve is just squashed to the side. And we actually rely on them having calcium and scar tissue on that valve. So it anchors the new valve in place because we don't get to sew it in. We just rely that it gets wedged on in there and that it doesn't move. And so there are some people whose valves don't have enough scar tissue for us to be able to do this procedure. So sometimes people have leaky valves with no scar tissue and that's a different problem and often they're not candidates for this procedure. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is that these valves that we put in, they definitely, definitely, definitely can get scar tissue on them. And so that's why they only last for about a decade. In some people, they last for seven or eight years. Most people on average, they last about 10 years. Some people are lucky and they're going to last for 15 or 18 years. Um, and we know that because the same stuff that's used to create these valves is what's used to create the surgical valves as well. Um, and so we have a lot of experience because people have been getting those valves put in surgically for about 30 or 40 years. Then is the wrist used to insert the stent and what is the rate of success rather than having to use an artery in the leg? Is there a different valve surgery entirely? Yeah, so that's a good question, but that is referring to something a little bit differently. So the we generally are able to put a lot of different things in the blood vessels using the arteries in the wrist. That is limited only by the size of how, how much we can kind of shrink the device in order to fit it through. And so we need, in the wrist, you can work through something that's about two or three millimeters in diameter. And so we can do almost all the heart artery stenting procedures where all you're doing is putting in a heart artery stent or stents sometimes in the carotid arteries or in the arteries in the brain. That stuff we do almost entirely through the arteries in the wrist, almost all the time. So, so if someone comes in with a heart attack, which is a little bit different problem, we often put heart, we put heart artery stents in through the artery in the wrist. This stuff I was talking about tonight because the devices are three centimeters across, they can only be squashed down to a tube that's about the size of this pen. And so it's five or six millimeters across, which is way bigger than the artery that someone has in their wrist. And so we can only fit the devices through a bigger tube. And so for all this valve stuff, we have to go through the artery in the leg or sometimes through the artery in the neck or we make a small surgical incision, say here, or here, or here, uh, but we can't fit it through the arteries in people's wrists. That's only for devices that are smaller than this. So, um, you know, I'm wearing my scrubs. I'm on call later tonight. If someone comes in with a heart attack, we're doing the stent procedure through their wrist artery. But if someone needs a valve procedure, that's going through the leg artery. Um, what kind of machines do you use when you're doing these procedures? Yeah, that's also a good question. So the room that we do these procedures in is awesome. It's super cool to people who like technology. So the room has the ability to be both an x-ray room because we're working inside the body from the outside and we need to use x-rays to see things in real time. It has a, several huge TV monitors, kind of like the biggest flat screen TVs you've seen that are like 95 inches across that can put all the x-ray images and the monitoring images and all this stuff on. So it's kind of like looking uh, at a room that has multiple things, kind of like what you would imagine like the control room for the Super Bowl would be, which is very cool. The x-ray machine is this robot that can go all around the patient and be moved around the room into different configurations, which is also very cool. And that costs 
somewhere in the ballpark of a million and a half dollars. And then we have all of the equipment that the anesthesiologists use to safely sedate patients uh, or put them totally to sleep. So there's a whole other set of computers, monitors, anesthesia devices, a ventilator, there's a heart lung machine. We can all of a sudden switch from doing a procedure that uses the x-ray machine outside the body to opening the patient's chest and doing full open heart surgery. So to build the room, it costs somewhere in the ballpark of between four and $5 million. And every hospital that does this has to have a room like that or very similar. And so the technology is awesome. It's really cool. And getting it to work together is also uh, like something that's very interesting. So we, like me, the doctor, relies very, very, very heavily uh, on the engineers who work in the hospital who keep all this stuff running uh, and kind of um, everything working together. Because when our systems don't talk together, we have a big problem. And you can't have this stuff fail. We need to have it work because we have someone on the table who we're working on. So it's a big process. As I said, this is a team game uh, and there's a lot of machinery. There's a big team to do these procedures. And so even though to the patient, it seems like, oh, you go in, you get put to sleep or sedated, you have the procedure, you get a new heart valve, you go back to the recovery area, you go home the next day. Like there's 15 or 20 people at one time kind of working on your case. Um, and it's kind of like this giant, giant, giant team that works together. And we all have to know what we're doing. I don't know. In the last few years, I've gotten very into Formula One car racing, uh, like a lot of people have. And like when you see them change the tires on those race cars really fast, uh, it's cool. It's this whole team working in concert together. And so that's when we are working well, that's what it's like uh, because the technology is pretty impressive. And yet we're still working on a patient uh, and we got to be tuned into that person. Well, speaking of patients, apparently you did a mitra clip procedure on somebody's husband that is there tonight. And she said, amazing procedure, talented doctor. So <laughs> well done you. Okay. <laughs> um, since you brought up cost, could you go into the, I mean, hypothetical cost, if you don't know the actual answer, difference of using TAVR versus other surgical techniques? Has it become more cost effective since TAVR has become so much more common? Yeah, that's a, I know all the numbers very well because we talk about this stuff a lot. It's actually really, really interesting. So most of these patients who have this procedure um, are patients who are on the older side. And so in the United States, that means they are covered by Medicare insurance. So Medicare, for instance, pays the hospital the same amount of money, no matter how you get your valve replaced, either with open heart surgery or with the uh, valve procedure. Open heart surgery is a huge deal as well. The operating room is expensive. Putting patients on the heart lung machine is expensive. The valve that's made uh, by the companies that make the valve is a few thousand dollars. The same companies make the TAVR equipment, these valves, and charge much, much more. So for instance, the hospital is charged about $30,000 to buy the valve for these procedures. And so it's expensive. Um, the in terms of cost effectiveness, the we are willing to do that because the recovery for these procedures is so much less. And so you don't either the person or the hospital or the system doesn't have to incur the cost of a person being in the hospital for a week. Most people are in the hospital for just one day. So the cost and like from a hospital perspective, the profitability or from a society perspective, how much it costs to do this stuff is actually quite similar. And the companies that make the valves are quite savvy because they know exactly that cutoff and that's why they charge more for the valves. Um, and so it's understandable, like the amount of research and technology that went into developing this stuff was tremendous. It was a huge amount of money that the companies that developed this stuff invested to run the studies, to develop the technology in order to do this. And so they're trying to recoup that cost by charging a lot for the valve. So these are expensive procedures. But as I showed you before, like when people need this stuff, they really need it. Otherwise, they're not going to do very well. Oh, here's an interesting question. Can your heartbeat sound get affected if a patient has a valve replacement? Ah, great question. That's awesome. So uh, that's like old school medicine. That's awesome. So oh, when people have this problem before their valve is replaced, they have a very loud heart murmur. And that heart murmur kind of comes when the blood speeds up to go through the narrowed valve. It's kind of like the water rushing through the rapids in the Colorado River. There's all this roar of all that churning water. That same thing happens as blood speeds up going through the narrowed heart valve. And so you develop 
this sound, and that sound we call a heart murmur. When we put in a new heart valve, that murmur changes character a lot. It gets a lot quieter and has a very distinctive sound. So yeah, the heart sounds change, but it still doesn't sound normal. So even after we replace the heart valve, people have a separate kind of murmur that's like very distinctive for replaced valves. And so people go from one kind of murmur to a different kind of murmur, and they never go back to like totally normal where they have no heart. But that's a great question. Um, because to me that like understanding that really allows us to understand what's happening, what I call physiologically, like what's happening in the body that generates these sounds and like, what's the physics behind that? I think it's so cool. I agree. I like that question. Um, if you were to change something about the uh, Tabor to make it work better, what would you change? Ah, good question. Um, I would... That's hard. <laughs> uh, I would make it so that if the valve wears out, we could more easily put in a second valve. And there's some ideas about how you do that, like the ring that's around the valve or the stent is kind of stretchy and moves out. Uh, and so that's one of the big downsides of this procedure is that people are going to outlive these valves because they're only going to last, say, 10 years. Uh, and then what do we do after that, the second time around? That's a big limitation. And so if I could fix one thing, I'd fix, I'd make it easier to put the second valve in. Um, so how do you make sure that the taver does not slip or break after being inserted? That is an important question. So we do a lot of things. We do a lot of testing before the procedure with mostly CAT scans and sometimes with echocardiograms to make sure that we are selecting the right size valve and that the person has enough calcium on their valve leaflets that when we put in the new valve, it sticks. If you have the valve move, that's a catastrophic problem that usually results in someone dying. Um, that, that's a bad complication and we do everything we can to prevent that. And so we use a valve that's generally actually a little bit bigger than the valve that's there. So it kind of squeezes everything into place and we rely on the valve being very calcified before we agree to do this procedure. Are patients with AFib, with pacemakers, with chronic heart failure able to have this procedure if needed? Yes. So, um, we can do this procedure. We can get many, many people through this procedure. Um, and most of the people, truthfully, who have this procedure have some other heart-related issue. Um, that just comes as a result of people developing this disease, like when they're in their 70s and 80s. And so by that time, oftentimes people have other problems. So people who've had previous bypass surgery, sometimes people who've had previous valve surgery even can have this. People who've had heart rhythm problems like AFib can also have this procedure. Sometimes we actually cause heart rhythm problems uh, with this procedure. We didn't really get into that. And sometimes people need pacemakers after the procedure. Um, so there's a host of things. But one of the nice things about Taber is that we can get a lot of people through the procedure in a way that open heart surgery, like, doesn't allow. And so if people have really significant heart failure, for instance, where their heart is weak, it becomes really hard to get someone like that through open heart surgery safely. Um, whereas this procedure, we can get many more people through the procedure just because it's less invasive. You don't need to have total sedation. And so someone doesn't need to recover from anesthesia. And so the recovery is a lot less. So people who are much more frail can have this procedure. People who have many more heart-related issues can have this procedure. The only time we really say absolutely not people can't have the procedure is if we think they're not going to benefit because some other medical problem is likely to take their life. And so, for instance, if someone has a, another kind of terrible cancer, for instance, that doesn't have a good prognosis where we think it's pretty unlikely that they're going to live a year or two, then it often doesn't make sense for someone to go through a procedure even like this that is pretty invasive, even though it's less invasive uh, than open heart surgery. And so that's the time when we shy away. But there's no specific heart related issue that says means absolutely somebody can't have this. 
personal question. Are you able to balance your work and family life well? I remember you said you were on call at 2 a.m. and I was just wondering if you get to spend enough time at home. Ah, oh, that's an important question. Um, yeah, I mean, yes, this is a hard job and we work long hours. I am part of a big group and we take call and people can have heart attacks uh, at all hours. And so somebody needs to be on call all the time. We have a whole team of people who are on call all the time. And if someone's having a heart attack, I get alerted on my phone through an app we have, uh, and I need to be in the hospital ready to do a procedure within half an hour. And that's an intense existence. Like there's not a lot of jobs that have that. That said, when we are not on call, we do everything we can for each other as colleagues to ensure that we are home. And, um, that's super duper important. And so I like I have two young children uh, and I am home for dinner every single night that I'm not on call, which is like one in 10 nights uh, and one in 10 weekends. And we have dinner together every single night and I pick my kids up at the activities they do. And that is a hugely important part. And there are people who have this kind of job who work themselves like crazy. Um, I don't think I would like that tremendously. I love the job, but I love my family more. And that's super duper important. Many of my colleagues have young kids and like it's important to all of us. Um, I don't think it would be very sustainable to do this as a career uh, if we didn't see our families. There. Are there any restrictions after having TAVER, for example, exercise? Uh, for about a week, you got to let the area where we've gone in heal. We like to see people back after a week. We examine the areas where we've gone in at the top of the leg and the groin. Uh, we make sure everyone's heart rhythm is okay and that their heart valve sounds good. Um, after about a week, people can do anything they want, which is cool. Um, because for heart surgery, um, there's a number of weeks where you can't drive, for instance. You can't do a lot, you can't lift uh, anything heavier than something like you know a book or a glass of water. Whereas with TAVR, the restrictions are just for five or seven days. Uh, and then people can do literally anything they want. So that's been the major benefit of the procedure. How do you make sure that the equipment used to go through the artery does not damage the walls of the artery? Ah, uh, well, we do a lot of imaging, as I said. So everybody who has this procedure essentially uh, has a CAT scan that looks at the blood vessels like from the tip of their head uh, to about their mid thigh. And we look at those blood vessels on the path we're going to take. And so the blood vessels need to be bigger or the same size as the tubes we're going to sneak through those blood vessels. You know, you can't have um, a tube go through a pipe that's smaller than the tube is. Um, and so we're careful about that. One of the risks of this procedure is that we can sometimes cause damage to the blood vessels themselves. But there's a lot of tips and not there's a lot of tips. There's a lot of tricks that we use. So we first put up small flexible wires and all of these tubes go over those wires and kind of take the road. So they're not pushing into the wall. Um, that's kind of one of the mainstays of this, all these kinds of procedures that are done in blood vessels. And so we do that. And we're just, we're very careful. And in order to do this procedure, you have to have a lot of experience doing it with smaller equipment. And so you have to be very comfortable using two millimeter tubes in the blood vessels before you can use a seven millimeter tube, for instance, because if you're not careful, you can cause a lot of mayhem. Um, there are two questions in the chat asking if this type of procedure would be done on children or infants. Now, I know you said that they'll outlast their valve, but do you want to comment on that? Yeah, so this is not usually a when people who are either infants or children have valve problems, uh, this is not a great therapy for them for a number of reasons. One is people's hearts are growing and we need to account for that in how we treat them. And so when people have valve issues, often this is not the perfect therapy. It's pretty unusual that people would have valve issues that would allow them to be treated with this technology. And so the answer to that is no, but sometimes we do use the same equipment to treat like people who are adolescent age or young adults in other valve positions where they were born with other kinds of valve problems, not aortic valve problems, but we use the same equipment to treat people's pulmonary valves, for instance. I didn't really get into that, but sometimes. We also do do a lot of interventional procedures on kids uh, with catheters that can help them also avoid heart surgery. That's usually for things like when people are born with abnormal connections in their heart or holes in their heart. 
that uses a little bit different equipment. Um, that's a little bit of a different discussion, but the techniques are kind of similar where people have developed these pieces of equipment or devices that can go in through catheters that get put in through the blood vessels rather than having to open somebody's chest and put them totally to sleep. Do functional heart murmurs generally require intervention? If so, what would the interventions be and what are the outcomes? So that's a complicated question. A heart murmur just means the sound that's generated with blood flow through the heart. And that can happen for a lot of different reasons. When people say that they have a heart murmur that's functional, that usually means like not a problem, won't be a problem. Most of the time, that's how that term is used. And so there's lots of people who, if you were to listen carefully and you have a lot of experience listening to people's hearts with a stethoscope, have heart murmurs that mean absolutely nothing in the course of that person's life. And so they often don't need any treatment, um, but rarely certain kinds of heart murmurs uh, can be associated with things like valve narrowing and, or valve leakiness. And those things need to be taken really seriously. So it requires a little bit of a distinction between what someone is talking about. And that's you know, one of the things that people learn in medical school and residency and fellowship training is to be able to distinguish those heart murmurs. Sometimes we also can't distinguish with just a stethoscope. Um, and we do a procedure like an ultrasound to get a sense of, is the heart murmur coming from a process that we think is benign or not a problem? Or is it coming from a process that we think is gonna need to be followed and is gonna need treatment? So I would say the bottom line is this, most people who have heart murmurs don't need anything done. And it ends up being what I would call a benign or not problem. Um, occasionally, people who have heart murmurs need to be followed carefully by an expert like a cardiologist. What classes should a high school freshman take if they are interested in a career in cardiology? Ah, interesting. So uh, I would say this. If you are interested and you are a high school freshman, I think it is important to be facile with math and science. But... It's also important to learn to read and write well. And so um, those things actually are all the same things that are required in college, because you got to go to college after high school in order to go to medical school. You can be any kind of major in college. You can be a science major. You can be an English major. You can be a Spanish major. You can be an economics major and still go to medical school. Everybody has to take a certain number of science courses a certain number of math courses and a certain number uh, of kind of literature writing classes. And that's actually reflected in the tests you have to take. So to go to med school when you're in college, you have to take this standardized test. It's not the SATs or the ACTs. It's called the MCAT. Uh, and it requires, there's sections just like on the ACT or SAT that are uh, on science related stuff uh, and are on like verbal reasoning and communication stuff. So um, the standard kind of high school pre-college curriculum is totally fine. Here's an interesting question. Do you do anything for patients who are um, unwilling to use certain things like vegan patients or patients who can't receive blood transfusions? What kind of accommodations can you make for them? Yeah, so you don't need to be able to do blood transfusions or be able to want blood transfusions in the event that they're necessary to have this procedure, for instance. We can do this procedure. Most people who have this procedure don't need any blood products. Um, for people who are serious about not wanting certain animal products, and that can happen because of personal beliefs. Sometimes it happens for religious preferences. People don't want, say, pork-related or pig-related products. Um, then we accommodate people as best as possible. I will generally have a discussion with patients about what they want, and then we work out what's possible for them. Obviously, we're never going to force people uh, to do things that they don't want. It's up to them, but I think people are entitled to be informed about what the implications of their decisions are. Sure. Um, you mentioned being on call for heart attacks and putting in a stent if needed. How much blockage in the heart artery would someone need to have to get a stent? It depends, like many things. So heart attacks generally are caused when people have a narrowing in their heart arteries called the coronary arteries. So the heart is the pump. We talked about the valve that sits on top of the heart, but then the heart arteries come and kind of sit on top of the heart and provide blood vessel, blood to the heart so it can function like every other muscle. 
So those are called the coronary arteries. And it depends on the situation. Oftentimes, when you're just walking around, people can have a lot of blockage and not need stents. But sometimes that blockage or the area where that blockage is develops a blood clot that can form, boom, just like that. And if the artery goes from being open with the passage of some blood flow to being totally clogged, that's usually what causes a heart attack. And so sometimes people have an artery that was open an hour ago, and now it's 100% blocked. And sometimes we put a stent in in that situation. There are other times when people are not having heart attacks or have different kinds of heart attacks where it's not a total blockage, but it's just a narrowing where things can be, say, 70, 80, 90% blocked, and we'll put stents in in those situations. So it depends a little bit on the situation and what the person is going through. So there's no absolute hard and fast rule. There's plenty of people walking around with 100% blockages who either never know, knew that they had a problem or don't need a stent procedure. And sometimes 100% blockage is a major, major problem. So context is king. All right, I'm going to end with a two-part question because you've been answering questions for like half an hour now. How many procedures have you done in total and how many would you say you do in a day? Oh, uh, how many do I do in a day? Today, I did three procedures. I did two valve replacements and a stent procedure. Uh, I also did some other stuff and saw some patients in our in like the outpatient office today. So that was a pretty full day. Um, that's pretty typical for a day. Um, how many procedures have I done in my life? A lot. I don't know. In order, I'll say it like this. In order to sort of graduate from training, you need to do 250 stent procedures. You need to do 500 non-stent procedures where you generally do diagnostic procedures, take pictures, make measurements. Um, if you're going to do this valve related stuff, you have to do about 100 valves. That's sort of to graduate and be able to do this for real. But that's usually done in one or two years. And so I've now been doing this for eight years, kind of uh, in a full-time job. And so I've done thousands and thousands of procedures. Uh, and it is amazing how I am better at this now than I was when I first graduated and started doing this, even though I was good then and way better than when I started my training. You continue to get better. If you're careful and like tuned in, you can learn a lot as you do more and more. That's awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Wimmer, for coming. I know there are a bunch more questions in the question and answer in the chat that we just can't get to. Everybody has been very appreciative of you, and we really appreciate you coming and talking to the class. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Thank you, Dr. Wimmer. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bye -bye. everyone. We'll see you back here next week. Make sure you fill out that survey before nine o'clock. Or if you're on the phone, you give me an email. Thanks, everyone.